I, this concept came from someone else initially, and then I just got into it, and it just got farther and farther. It's actually pretty cool. So I want to, we're going to go into a very familiar passage today, but I think we're going to find new things as we go into it. So um, if you would just join me in prayer as we begin. Father God, I thank you so much for you being with us today, Lord, that you're, you, you are in this house, that you're in each one of us, Lord, and you're available for everyone who asks for you. And I pray, Lord, as we go forward, if you just give me the words that you want spoken and open our hearts and our ears to hear these things. I pray these, in, this, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Growing up, um, I grew up really close to my grandparents. My maternal grandparents lived with us for a while and really close to us most of my life. Every time we move, they move. They were right there. And my grandmother was originally from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. She married my, my grandfather during World War II. That's where he met her when he was out there before he went to Europe. And um, she was from a whole family of commercial fishermen. That's what all her brothers did. So when I was growing up, if we were going fishing, Grandma was taking me fishing. She was always the one taking me fishing. And she was obsessed with it. She enjoyed it. And at one point in time, well, first she started with a canoe because that's what she could afford. Um, that didn't last a whole long time. She was in her 60s and I was probably 10. And the two of us on a canoe in the Mississippi River was probably not the best choice. <laughs> so eventually she got to a flat bottom bass boat that we went out in. But there were times when you go out on something like the Mississippi or the Missouri here, or even when you drive by and you see those white caps, you know the wind's blowing and it's getting rough out there. If you're in a little aluminum boat out there, that is really rough, rough place to be. Because if you turn the wrong direction, you turn sideways and it starts rocking, it can wake you and all sorts of things. So this picture that's the background here, I put this up here and I thought, you know, yeah, I, I can... I can kind of sympathize with that because we did lose the motor once. The outboard went out and uh, grandma and I had to roll back to Bass Camp, which was about a mile and a half. So it was a long, long roll for the two of us, but um, it wasn't bad weather like this. But we're going to talk about a time here in the Bible that we're all familiar with, a passage we're all familiar with, where they are out on rough water. So... Let's go into this. Walking on water. This is Matthew 14. We all know this story, but I'm going to bring it up again. Uh, Matthew 14, 22 through 20, 36 says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Um, when I read this, I, I had a, a change in my mind a little bit. I always had a picture of Peter being out a ways from the boat, a long ways from the boat, when he started to sink. I'm not so sure anymore because it says, and then they climbed into the boat. So Peter might have taken two or three steps and started to go when Jesus grabbed him. So I, I don't know for sure anymore. It, that changed my perspective a little bit. But as we go through this, I want to bring out a couple of little pieces. And we're not going to talk too much about Peter walking on the water. We're going to talk about Jesus walking on the water and the scenario here that's set up. First off, it says they saw him walking on the lake and they were terrified. But then later on we see when Peter got out of the boat... He saw the wind, so he was afraid. So this was rough. This was rough seas. This wasn't a glassy lake. This was rough. And the other thing we got to remember is at least four of the disciples were professional fishermen before they were called. And as fishermen, we've talked about this before, in Galilee, they would have only fished at night. 
So for them to go out and take off in a boat in, at night and go across the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, it's not a big deal. That was okay. And I'm sure they've met kind of rough, rough water before. So they're out there working. It's a lot of work to row, but they're going. And then all these things happen. But they're afraid. They're all afraid here. Go ahead. I want to bring this passage back here. This is earlier in Matthew 8. It says, Then they got, he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples woke him and said, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You have little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. This happened before this incident where we see Jesus walking on the water. So they've been in this place before. They've been in a boat, rough seas, things are going not so good. They wake him up and he rebukes it and calms it down. They've been there before. So now they're there again and they're still, oh, it's a ghost walking on the water. I'm sure Jesus is like, guys, come on. You saw what happened. Well, I want to take us back again. Go ahead. I'm going to take us back again to Matthew 14. And I underlined a few things. These are my highlights in here. If we look here, it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Jesus told them to do this. Obviously, they wouldn't have left him behind by accident or even by intention. They left him behind because he said, I want you to go. I'll, get, I'll meet you on the other side. I want you to go to the other side, and I'll meet you over there. And then he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went on the mountainside. Later that night, he was alone on this side. They're over there. And we're going to get into John here. John's version of this a little later on. It says it's about three miles out wow. onto uh, Sea of Galilee, a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind against it. So we know the waves are coming up. These guys are working hard. If you ever have to row into the wind, it's going to be hard. Okay, So they're, they're working their way into the wind. They couldn't have thrown a sail up and gone that way. You've got to row into it. And then it says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on, on the lake. So Jesus goes out to them. But I want us to bring up these points here. So go ahead to the next one, Susie. Jesus told them to leave him. He said, leave. I'm sending you to the other side. It was several miles away and the wind was up. So we know those things right now. So now I'm going to take you to another version, another gospel. This is the gospel of Mark. The exact same incident in a different gospel. So we have different perspectives. Um, there are some out there that will say that the Bible contradicts itself because things are different. It doesn't contradict itself. It's just that different people saw different things at the same time. If something happened in this church, if a car ran into that side of the church, and somebody took us individually and said, what did you hear? What did you see? What did you know? Everybody would have a slightly different perspective. Mark's got a little different perspective. He does not talk about Peter walking on the water here. But he does talk about the incident. So again, in, four, in Mark 6, 45, it starts out, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida, the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Almost exactly what Matthew said. But he goes in here and he says, Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. Okay, all that's the same. But then it said, he was about to pass them by. He said, I'll meet you on the other side. Mm -hmm. So he was going to the other side. And they're rowing against it. And I'm sure he's just walking on top of it saying, I'll, I'll see you over there. He's going. No big deal. I'm just going to meet you. I sent you over there. And I said, I'll meet you. But when they saw him walking, then they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. He climbed in the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. So we have some more details in this story. It's the same story, but we, since we have a second person, we have a few more details. We had that he told them to leave. He sent them to the other side. The boat was away. 
hard to row. He saw them. He saw them challenged by all these things. But he was going to pass them by. He wasn't worried about them rowing into the wind. Because he knows that they're capable. It's not a big deal. I got four fishermen on there. No big deal. I wouldn't have sent them into it if they couldn't handle it. So I'm just going to go. If they hadn't noticed him, he probably would have walked by, but wouldn't have had this story in the Bible. It wouldn't have been a big deal. But because they saw him, they were afraid. And he recognized their fear and immediately addressed it. Jesus didn't wait. He didn't rebuke them immediately and say, hey, I told you I'll be on the other side. I'll be there when you get there. He went to them because they were, they were in fear. Because they were having problems, he had to go to them. And when he did, he went to them and that wind died down. Just like in the passage we had, the earlier passage from Matthew, where it said, they woke him up and he rebuked the storm and just said, ah, calm down. To the people and to the storm. And was capable of doing it through both. <laughs> Jesus saw their terror. So he went to them. He hadn't intended to. That wasn't his original intention. He was just going to walk past. He was going to get there first. They'd been rowing all night. Wouldn't it be nice to have him meet you on the other side and go, it took us hours to get here. Yeah. I left a little before dawn. I probably would have started a fire and got breakfast going for him before they got there. But because of their fear, he had to deal with their fear. So while they were fearful because they thought he was a ghost, he came to them. In the first one, in the first passage we had out of Matthew, he came to them as well when they called him out. So both of these passages talk about all these details. But I love this, this part in, in uh, Mark where it says, he was going to pass them. First of all, going to pass him is, yeah, he's going to be on the other side, but he's walking faster than the boat's in the water. I thought that was kind of funny. Jesus is like, hi guys, <laughs> walk right past. They all freak out. So let's go to the third gospel that mentions this. Luke's gospel does not mention this exact incident. But Matthew, Mark, and John do. So in John, it's, again, a little simpler. It doesn't talk about Peter again. In John 6, it says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. <clears throat> By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. So John doesn't mention the, he sent us, he told us to go. But I think it would be implied, because I don't think they would have left him. They're following him, he's not following them. So I don't think they would have got in the boat without him, but John doesn't bother to mention that here. And then it says, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. I love that. John said, well, we decided it was okay to take him in the boat. If Jesus is walking on the water towards the boat, you're not going to stop him. But John says it that way. And then it said, immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Wow. So that's adding a little bit too. Not just the wind calming down, but we're there. Jesus steps in and, oh, we've been rowing all night. Because it said, when the evening came, they hit the lake. And the, and the passages all tell us that it was not until dawn that Jesus walked out. They've been going all night. When he shows up, they're there. This is a continuation of what Jesus had said initially, too. He said, I'll see you on the other side. You go ahead, I'll meet you there. Now, there's no way he could have walked around the Sea of Galilee and met them. It's too big. It's too long. It's very, very long this way. If you look at it on a map, it's... It's uh, top to bottom, it's long. They're, of course, taking the short, shortest trip straight across the middle. They left him behind because he told them to. He didn't have his own boat. He didn't have anything like that. didn't have anybody else to take him across. But when he said go, they went. But in the middle of their going, in the middle of him sending them out, fear got them again. Fear of the storm. Fear of seeing him thinking it was a ghost. Fear of things that should not have bothered them because they've been through these situations before. If we look back even a little bit farther and we go into uh, earlier in Matthew, it talks about him sending them out two by two. They've already been sent once. 
And when they were sent then, Jesus said, I'm giving you the power to cast out demons, to heal, to do all these things two by two. And these are the, these are the things I want you to do. And they all went. So they've done those things before. If they were casting out demons and, and healing people, could they not have said the same way Jesus did, tell the storm to calm down? Why would they fear, if they're casting out demons, why would they fear that this, this is a ghost walking at them? I, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd put demons a little ahead of the ghost, personally. But this happened to them. And that's that human frailty that we all have. We all have times when we know we should not feel the way we're feeling. We know that's not the way God wants us to act. We know that's not the thoughts that God puts in our head, but someone else puts in our head. That spiritual warfare comes upon us and fear is generated very easily. It happens even if you're a Christian, even if you're a follower of Christ, even if you're doing what he told you to do, sometimes that fear comes and sets in on us. But when Jesus sends us, we're not alone. When we are doing the will of God, when we are doing what God wants us to do, we are not alone. It's not a ghost walking beside the ship. We don't need somebody to hold our hand we, because God has already told us, he has given us his promise of what's going to happen. We are never alone. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For you, the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So we had, we assume, 12 guys in this boat. Four of them accomplished seamen. And they were sent by God. There should be no reason there's any fear in that boat at all. Even if it's choppy weather, even if it's the winds are a little bit rough, even if it's more work than usual, I can imagine uh, if you got a boat with 12 guys, you might have just four oars. And I would imagine they'd be yelling at a guy saying, you're out of timing, you're not working right. Yeah, you tax collector, row better than you are. Because there's one guy on the rudder stirring, steering and all those things going on. They were occupied, they were thinking, they were doing what they had to do. They were getting there, long ways, but they were getting there. And yet the fear got a hold of them because when one little thing happened, everything else stopped. When they thought it was a ghost, everything stopped. When they didn't understand something, it stopped. When they ran into an unexpected obstacle, which is what this was, they weren't in fear because of rowing the boat. That didn't cause the fear. They knew how to do that already. But what caused the fear is something they did not expect. And what does Jesus say to them every time? Oh, ye of little faith, don't you know? Don't you know? that you're doing what I told you to do, so you're fine. Don't you know that in the midst of all this stuff, I'm still here, I still got control, I'm still in charge, you don't have to worry about it. Isaiah 41.10 says, You do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Okay, so we've got these passages from Deuteronomy and Isaiah here saying, Fear not, I am with you. God says, I'm with you all the time. I'm there. But the other thing we need to grab a hold of here that goes beyond that is when these men were sent to the other side, Jesus said, I will see you on the other side. That means you'll be alive on the other side. There's nothing to worry about between here and there. You're going to go, and I'll meet you there. That was a promise Jesus made to them by sending them and saying, I'll, I'll meet you on the other side. It was a promise. And there's nobody whose promise I would trust more than Jesus Christ. When he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So there should be no fear there. And yet, in, in their weakness, just like in our weakness, it happens. Things happen, the fear comes in. But I want to look at some of Jesus' promises here. All of Jesus' promises, when he was speaking in the gospel, started with, I will. I will. There's some real power in that. Do you remember when, when uh, Moses was talking to... Um, the burning bush. And he's being sent by God. And he says, he gives all sorts of excuses and God keeps saying, but I'm sending you, shut your mouth, do what I tell you to do. 
You don't need to worry about the fact that you're not a public speaker. Just go. And Moses says, who shall I send? Who shall I say sent me? <coughs> what did God say? I am. Tell them I am sent you. Now this happens again. I didn't put the passage up here, but it happens again. If you look in your Bibles, when Jesus is arrested, when Jesus gets arrested and is taken to be crucified, and all the soldiers come up and confront him, and they say, he says, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm he. If you look at what happens next, all the soldiers fell over backwards. That statement, I am, came from Jesus with power at that point. So when he says, I will, there's a lot of power behind that. The first promise here, John 6, 37, it says, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Jesus says, if you come to me, I will not chase you away. If you come to me, I will take you in. You will be mine. You will not be pushed away by me. That doesn't mean that as humans we can't walk away. That doesn't mean we can't deny him, but he says, if you come to me, I will not push you away. I will not. Simple as that. Jesus says, I will not push you away. If you come to me, I will never drive you away. You will be mine. The second I will promise, Matthew 4, 19 says, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. I will make you fishers of men, is what it says. It's on the cover of my Bible here. Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Again, these are fishermen he's talking to, so the concept of fishing, yeah. Fishing for fish, fishing for men. But again, he says, if you follow me, this is going to happen. It will happen. He doesn't say it might. He doesn't say it could. He doesn't even say it should. He says, I will send you out. To fish for men. I will. So as followers, we are sent. Just like his disciples were sent to meet him on the other side. As followers, we are sent. Another promise here in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That is an awesome promise. Anybody here never get weary? Anybody in here never feel like they got the weight of the shoulders, just the weight of the world just sitting on their shoulders. It happens a lot. It happens often. Sometimes it's self-induced. Sometimes we take the weight and dump it on ourselves when we probably shouldn't. Sometimes we do things like that. We, we take that ball and chain and hook it to our ankle and drag it behind us when we don't need to. But Jesus said, if you come to me, I'll give you rest. I'll take the weight off of you. I'll carry it for you. When Jesus said... My yoke is light, and we're supposed to pick up our cross. What he was saying is, you're not carrying anything by yourself. I'm with you. And yet we still have a tendency to jump in and put the weight on ourselves. And he says, if you just come to me, I'll give you peace. I'll give you rest. You can rest in me. So I'm not going to drive you away. I'm going to send you out. That's not being driven away. There's a big difference. And... If you come to me, I'll give you rest. A couple more here. I just want to finish up with these. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. In this world, Jesus is not going to walk, walk over and get in my boat ever. He's not physically here to do that. But he doesn't need to be. He sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us so that we have him in our personal vessel all the time. That's a big deal. And when he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you the advocate, another advocate, someone to speak for us, someone to speak through us, someone to guide us, someone to teach us. Jesus laid these things out so we would not have to be alone. Everybody's going to be in a storm sometime. Everybody is going to have that situation where you feel like you're on a boat and you're going to sink. You're barely floating. You're working hard at it. And then the water comes over the side. And you panic. If you've ever had to bail a boat, you know what panic is. 
You're trying to get the water out faster than water came in. Grandma and I had that situation once, and the only thing we had to bail with was the can that we had worms in. You know how long it takes to throw water over with a little, one of those small coffee cans? Because we always got our own worms. Grandma, they can get up in the middle of the night and find them, earthworms. But we're trying to throw with this little tiny coffee can. It feels hopeless. It feels like you'll never catch up. But God is with us. And when you're bailing water, when it's gotten to that point where you've been in the storm, things are going on, and you still haven't found peace, and you still haven't found rest, and you still haven't got through that storm, think about why you have to bail. Maybe it's because you haven't gone back for the rest that he said, come to me and I will give you rest. Maybe you put yourself in a situation you probably shouldn't have been in. Every year, growing up in Minnesota on the Mississippi, and one thing I did not do, because I just don't see the logic in it, I like fish, but I can't see sitting on a frozen lake on a bucket with a hole in the ice. I just don't get that. I never understood that. But in Winona, where I lived, um, fish shacks were common. I went out one time with a friend of mine. He was a classmate. His dad was our science teacher. And I went out to their fish shack, and we watched the Vikings game. And they had heaters. No wonder you don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> but they had a Vikings game on, and they had heaters in there, and they had a hot plate. We had a hot lunch. Mm-hmm. We're ice fishing, and it's better than you know some apartments I've had. But I still never quite got into it. And one of the reasons I never quite got into it is every single spring, somebody would wait too long to pull the house off the ice. And some of them would drive out to that house when they're new and uh-huh. get it off in time. So every year there's ice houses that fall through the ice and cars that fall through the ice. Because they waited too long to do what they knew they should do. And then they lost. And sometimes we're in that same situation. Sometimes we wait too long to go say, well, God, I need your peace. I need your rest. I need to let go. I need to let go and let you. Simple as that. Sometimes we forget that, and uh, sometimes it, we're going to lose a car and up in the lake. It happens, and trust me, you, you can tow it back out of the Mississippi River, but it ain't ever worth anything. Everybody knows you're the guy with the ice house truck. They're not taking you. So, all these promises of God are things that we can rely on if we remember to use them. If the disciples had remembered to rebu- rebuke the storm, it wouldn't have been a big deal. If they had remembered that he said, I will meet you over there, and then they see him and think he's a ghost, come on, it's Jesus. You know Jesus. He walks over and gets in the boat, even though John says, we willingly let him in. He came to them, and they knew it was him when he came. So why were they afraid of it? They let the fear get into it. Now the last I will statement is one that we really got to grab a hold of and hold on to. And this is from John 14, 3. It says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back for you and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. And this is obvious, obviously right before the ascension. Jesus is saying, I'm going to my father's house, but I'll come back and get you and you're going to go with me. I will come back and take you back with me to where I was. You're coming to my house. I will come and get you. Just like he's told the disciples, I will meet you on the other side. Jesus said, I'm going to come back. I'm going to meet you on the other side of your life, of your troubles, of your challenges on this earth. The time is coming when Jesus meets us on the other side. It's going to happen because he said it will, because it's a promise. And we have to remember, just like the disciples needed to remember as they were crossing over, that he said, I'll meet you on the other side. So no matter what happens in your life, Jesus said, I'll meet you on the other side. I'll be there for you, and I will take you with me. He said, I have to leave. I'll give you an advocate to help you during this time frame, during this life that you have, during this blink of an eye that we have in our lifetimes. Jesus said, you'll have the Holy Spirit with you. And when it's over, I'll meet you on the other side. We're never alone. We're never abandoned. We're never forsaken. 
He never pushes us away. He just says, expect me to be on the other side. I'll be there for you. I think we take great comfort in the fact that Jesus says we're not alone. And take great comfort in the fact that Jesus says, I will be with you always. And when it's over, when you take your last breath, when this is done, I'll be there too. Because I'm going to come back and get you. I'm not going to abandon you. Not in life, not in death. Because Christ conquered death. There's nothing that can drive between us because he said, you're mine. And I'll come get you. And we're going home. That old saying, you know, he pulls up in the pickup and says, hop in the back, we're going to the house. The time's coming when Jesus will say, there you are. It's time to go to the house now. You've done, you've done your, your life. You've walked your walk. But in the meantime, between now and then, while we're on that long trip rowing against the wind that we do in this earth, we have to remember these promises and hold on to that and make that our foremost thought. Our foremost thought should be what Jesus promises, not what Satan throws at us, not what the world does to us, now what can happen in this lifetime? Jesus told us we're going to have troubles. We're going to be challenged. As his followers, it's not easy. People will persecute you if you're following Christ. People will push and shove and demean you. Just this week, the uh, Department of Homeland Security said the greatest threat, the greatest terrorist threat in the United States right now, followers of Donald Trump, former military people, and anyone who's religious. That was a, that was a published uh, document that they just got through uh, Freedom of Information. Our own government saying being religious is something that's, that's a threat to the society. We've gone a long way from founding fathers that got on their knees and prayed before they, before they signed the Constitution, before they did anything like that. We've come a long way from that. And we're living in those times. That's the times we are here for. And we're not here by accident. And we're not here... Because it just happened that way. God put us here for a reason. And he sent us to meet him on the other side, just like he did with the disciples. So we look at the disciples and we say, oh boy, those guys lost their faith. We have to look at ourselves daily, pick up our cross and say, did I lose my faith enough to be afraid? Did I lose my faith enough to be hurt, to be angered? Did I lose my faith enough that I didn't just keep rolling to the other side where he's waiting for me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word today, Lord. I thank you that your promises are forever and your promises are consistent and your promises are never without truth. I thank you for the love that you share with us, the love that you give us, Lord, when we don't deserve it. I thank you, Lord, that when I hear, oh, ye of little faith, it doesn't mean I'm gone and you're going to push me away. It's just that you're going to give me another chance when I come to you in grace. I come to follow you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to live this life knowing what the future brings and to live this life knowing that we are not alone and you are with us. Father, help us as we get into some of these storms. Help us to call out to you before we, before we get sunk in too far. Help us to call out to you in the very beginning. Lord, we're weak. We struggle. We make mistakes. The challenges of this world can feel like the wind tearing into us as we're, and we're rowing against it. We're not getting anywhere. But Lord, that's not the way you want us to live. That's not what you promised us. Give us the, the wisdom and the courage and the strength to lean on you and say, I'm just giving it to you. Because that's what you want us to do. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.